I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat, we drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco, and every time I come back here, I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum. Welcome to today's program with our guest, Zerlina Maxwell. Zerlina is an MSNBC political analyst, a commentator, a speaker, and author of the new book, The End of White Politics, How to Heal Our Liberal Divide. Darnell Moore will be moderating this conversation. He's a former Inforum speaker, a director of inclusion for content and marketing at Netflix, an activist and author of the book, No Ashes in the Fire coming of age, black and free in America. If you'd like to ask either of them a question during this program, you can do that in either the chat or comment section of the live stream that you're watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but to keep you informed during this pandemic, we're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programs. Most of these conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work. You can visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 during this program. Now, please join me in welcoming Zerlina Maxwell and Darnell Moore to Inforum. Wow, Crystal, thank you so much for the introduction and welcome, and big thank you to Inforum for inviting us to have this conversation. Zerlina, I'm so excited. Me too. To be in conversation with you. It's been a <laughs> long too. time coming. I know. 
<laughs> we exist in so many shared worlds um, and connected to a bunch of folk who are friends and family to us. And yeah. I've just been marveling over your work for the last decade. So I'm really happy to be here to celebrate your book. Thank you. Oh, you have <laughs> oh it. Oh my gosh, I have it. I have it. I didn't come to play. I'm like, I'm so moved. Um, Thank you. So look, I want to just name like the context through which we're having this conversation. I don't think mm -hmm. there is a, a more opportune time to be talking about the end of white politics than now and what might be right. considered like a storm within a storm, right? Um, where everything from pandemics to all of the racialized violence that is occurring in our streets, um, you can't have a conversation about any of those facets of our of our human experience unless we think deeply about the racialized impact. So I just want to jump right in because I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. like, oh, I'm all right, ready. cool. Let me <laughs> look. I, the first thing I want to note and, and that I want to just celebrate you for is that in reading the book, it's really clear to me that you are writing not just from the perspective and standpoint of a Black woman, but you're writing into this political vision of yours, this cultural analysis, a Black feminist intersectional lens. Yes. And by virtue of it being Black feminist, it has to be intersectional. So right. shout out to Kimberly Crenshaw for <laughs> exactly. that, right? But I want to read some words from the book um, and because I just think that they're important. And it seems to me this has become the frame through which you are helping us to understand your political vision. You write, these silos exist in a progressive movement, but more so in the form of divides. The intersection of race, gender, class, and sexual orientation is the place where the most work can be accomplished if policymakers of the future come to the table with an understanding that one, lived experiences matter when it comes to informing effective policies, and two, not all lived experiences are the same, even within shared minority or demographic experiences. A white woman and a black woman are not treated the same in our society. Neither is a straight black man and gay Latino one. And it's in the mess of the disparate treatment that progressives need to focus on the future. Identity matters in politics. It informs the quality of our lives in some instances, despite the conservative mantra that every outcome is, de is determined by a person's work, ethic, and drive. That lie has become exposed, especially as more and more historically marginalized people come into positions of political power. So just starting with that, yeah. kudos. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, talk about the importance of writing this book via a Black feminist sort of centralized argument, why that's important for you um, in terms of helping us think through and expand our progressive political visions. Well, I just learned, you know, from so many of the feminists who came before me that unless you center the most marginalized in a conversation about how to uplift communities, you're doing it wrong. So you have to start by uh, centering the most marginalized in the conversation. And then also respecting the fact that people who have different identities, whether they be black and a woman or black and uh, gay, black, and maybe they have a different differing ability that the, the intersections of those identities impact their lived experiences, and it impacts how policy affects them. So, for example, um, you know the black uh, mortality, uh, infant mortality rate, or even the outcomes that we're seeing now currently with COVID nineteen. Those things don't happen in a vacuum. You don't have more black women dying, um, you know, when they're giving birth, or more black and brown people passing away from COVID nineteen just because they're black and brown. Like that's not why. But the, the mess of, you know, why um, their lived experiences are what they are, why, why they don't get the, the appropriate medical treatment they need, why don't, why don't they get safe and affordable housing, why do not, they not have living wages and health insurance, all of those things have to do with the intersections of those, those identities. And I just feel like unless you understand that fundamentally and you're sort of grounded in that before you go and in, launch into analysis, you, your analysis is going to be incorrect. And on the left, oftentimes we ignore all of those things. We're like, or or we we just we operate within our our selected silos. Like I'm a climate activist, right? But yeah, okay. So do you understand that climate is an, a racial justice issue? And here are the number of ways it's a racial justice issue. Do you, do you understand that it could be a gendered issue in terms of you know whether or not people are having um, you know health issues as a result or fertility issues as a result of pollution or toxic um, chemicals in their water, for example. Right. right. So I think, I, I think that you just have to look at how stuff is affecting people 
And it's just not affecting people the same way. I mean, I just, as a black woman, I think maybe it's sometimes it's easier for us to see that because we often are tr- mistreated. And so, and, and a lot of times, you know, especially as a younger person, I'd be like, well, I'm not sure if you're being that way to me because I'm black or I'm a woman or both, but I know you're treating me differently than that person. Or I know this, this is impacting me differently than someone who doesn't look like me. And, and why is that? And so like, that's where I sort of find it interesting to sort of unpack that and figure out the ways in which we can, you know, organize across those differences, on, right. especially on the left. Because I think fundamentally our value set is, you know, trying to uplift everyone, not just a select few, or at least that's what I hope our value Listen, set is. It's a value set and it's a vision that you're offering yeah. that is so shaped by, you know, as you talk, I think about Audre Lorde, who's asking mm-hmm. us yeah. to celebrate difference and not use right. that as a, as a um, sort of a, the, the frame for which we are um, pushing against difference are each other, right? I, right? So I'm in love with this. Like I'm, I'm reading it and I'm, what I love is that, that your black womanhood, your black womanhood, your black woman standpoint, your black feminist standpoint is so present in the book which brings me to the title yes. which some may think it's provocative right <laughs> yeah. but in, in like I'm you know I know part of the title was influenced by your participation in Politicon which is funny because yeah. I did Politicon before and I'm reading I'm like I know this story yeah. I know those folk in that green room um yeah. and in many ways your title is speaking to the premise of the book it's a call really to refuse the white gaze it's a call to refuse centering whiteness and white people's needs especially white men it's a coalitional politic it's an aspirational one you actually say that in the book Mm -hmm. it's a call right for this moment um so in so many ways you are writing ahead of this particular iteration right black freedom struggle right like right this new iteration of the movement for black lives had yet occurred even though we're always in it but you almost wrote like in perfect timing to be in conversation with the moment. So I'm interested if you can talk about the release of this book that you had been, you know, I'm sure you're thinking about the words, writing it before this moment happens and just the sort of perfect storm in which you're writing in. I mean, I think it's, it's really weird because when I first went into quarantine, I was like, is it going to be relevant anymore? Because I'm writing about, you know, the election. And so quarantine is such a big existential situation that it felt like, well, maybe an election feels really small, you know, in terms of the conversation about what's happening right now with COVID. Um, And just like clockwork, though, um, the police killed a black man and it was on camera. And then they killed another a black woman and then another black man and then another black man. And they're just still killing. They're still actually, I just saw something yesterday. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, so it's still continuing. So as you said, you know, the movement is always going, it's, mm-hmm. it, you know, they, they fight, they fail, they, they go inside, they rest, they come back out um, when, when it's necessary. And I think that, you know, when in the beginning of COVID, I was worried that it wouldn't be relevant um, but when I saw George, the George Floyd video, which I did not, frankly, watch the entire thing because I, they're, they're, I just can't physically um, watch those videos anymore. Um, and even Ahmed Arbery a few days before that, or I think mm-hmm. a week before that, you know, I went back to the chapter on the white resistance and I was like, oh, OK, I think this is relevant still. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I actually fundamentally think what I'm saying is actually larger than just like what Biden should do or, you know, what the establishment should do. I'm, t- I'm making a larger argument about, you know, the ways in which the left has to confront their own blind spots around privilege and racism, frankly, um, because it's most important in this moment, because we have a president who sided with or said there were very fine people standing among Nazis is, is how I right. sort of like to describe it, right? If you if you have, you know, Jess McIntosh, my co-host of Signal Boost, she always says, what do you have if you have you know, if you're standing among, you know, 10 Nazis, <laughs> 11 Nazis, like you have 11, right? I mean, you, mm-hmm. you can't, I think there, there, there's a clarity that's required. And I feel like, so that's why I feel like the book sounds, it resonates now because I was speaking to sort of larger issues that always pop up, mm-hmm. right? It, I think it was Maya Wiley on MSNBC. She was the first person to sort of use the pandemic within a pandemic framing. Yeah. The, the, the pandemic with the police killing of black people or just, the abuse of black bodies, violence com- committed against black bodies was happening within a pandemic that was also ravaging and killing black people in disproportionate numbers. And so, you know, I feel like this, the, the larger framework that I'm working within is, is always going to be relevant 
because in America we are founded on white supremacy. And so, you know, it, I feel there's a fly. <laughs> um, so, so I feel like, uh, just like it's going to land on my face, like it did the other day on TV, <laughs> but, um, but I do feel, I, I feel very strongly that, you know, we're never going to sort of get to the place we need to get to unless we have the real talk conversation now about the ways, I mean, Republicans may be a lost cause. So that's why I sort of focus this book on the progressive movement. Cause I mm-hmm. feel like they're at least willing to be open to a conversation of racial blind spots. I mean, everyone knows that it's true that, you know, white people don't look at themselves and what they're wearing before they go on a jog, you know, wondering if they may be mistaken for a burglar. That's just not a thought that you've ever had. And right. and I think it's, it doesn't, it's, I'm not, uh, you know, condemning you for not having that thought. I'm just making you aware that you've never had that thought. And to think about the people that do have to have that thought you know, in every context, not just jogging, um, and that your literal safety, you know, is sort of a, in relationship to what you look like in so many different contexts. And that is, that's anxiety inducing, that's stress inducing, you know, if, if talk about comorbidities with COVID, yeah. you know, they're like, oh, well, black people just have, you know, they have a lot of those pre-existing conditions. I'm like, you mean hypertension, anxiety, you know, heart disease, you know, things that are associated with, the effects of racism and and white supremacy on your physical health. So I think it's a, it's an important moment to have this conversation and really have it and not pretend like we're, you know, some aspirational model for how to do it because we we haven't really confronted so many of the things that we need to. Listen, I mean, you you preach it. I, I, <laughs> you know, I often say like one of the dangers of liberalism or liberalist politics is this idea that somehow to feel like you've shown up and got an understanding of racism only to discover that you're so complicit in it because of your failure to really address it. Um, right. So that is at the heart of what you're asking us to consider. One of the things that I love about the book, you pick up on <laughs> the this trend yeah. to, to rally against quote unquote identity politics. And in many ways that term has become like um, a, a term that people use around to weaponize, right. uh, it, you know, it be, it's become a term that folk want to think about as dangerous only when you understand that it's dangerous because, you know, right. identity politics only becomes a problem when the identities that, that beyond whiteness and maleness are centered. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if you can say more about that yeah. and why you felt the need to, to, to really highlight this in the book. This is a really important point for me um, because I, I hated that criticism post 2016 that what Hillary Clinton lost because she she played identity politics. I'm like, by saying that the LGBTQIA community should have legal rights and women should be treated equally and black people should be treated equally. That's a bad thing. I mean, I think that that sounds to me like a good thing. So so I I just I mean, you know, to be sort of funny about it, like it it was like, mm, no, also black feminists came up with the term and I just really, yeah, exactly. I fundamentally have a problem where like all of a sudden when people who are not white are advocating for their rights from their own lived experiences and perspective, it's a problem. Mm-hmm. But when we're, you know, when people are talking about flyover states or Midwestern voters or suburban women, like those are white people and we should say that. And you're centering the white experience and their lived uh, needs, um, you know, at the expense of everyone else. Stacey Abrams, I think, you know, she has done a lot in this space of trying to get people to really understand this in this current moment. And I think she's, her book also is excellent um, and very helpful in terms of, you know, where are you going to fit in and try to help in terms of voter suppression and, and trying to push back against these forces that are trying to marginalize our voices. But identity politics is something that, you know, white people are doing too. And Donald Trump, finally, I think, made people realize that our political conversation is centered a- around whiteness. Every single conversation I have about every poll and every registered and likely voter poll, is it's literally centered around white working class voters. It's like, you know, they break it down, they get the nuance, you know, the, the, the pie charts on election night on all of the channels. So it's not just white, it's all the channels. They're all like, you know, white people, you know, they you know, they're um, broken down by age, marital status, suburban, urban, high income, low income. And then it's like black people. That's the next slide. It's like black <laughs> vote. And I'm like, I just, I feel like we could do a better job of really explaining politics. 
and explaining, you know, the impact of policy on communities um, and centering, you know, only one experience in doing that is doing a disservice to the audience and the voters, frankly, not just the audience, the voters. Um, and I think that Democrats, elected Democrats, um, liberal media uh, journalists, they all can do a better job of, you know, not not repeating the same line or working within the framework of like, how is Joe Biden going to win over those, you know, Obama, Trump flip voters? I'm like, he doesn't need to. So he shouldn't really try very hard. He should try to go after the black people that they, we didn't engage enough. Because mm -hmm. had we engaged them enough, I mean, to the point, I think, you know, people misunderstand sometimes when you say, well, black turnout was down as, as though that's a condemnation of those black people that didn't turn out. Like, what reason would they need to turn out against Donald Trump? Well, obviously, we didn't give them a good enough one. That's on us. Right. right. We it's our job to ensure that they understand, you know, what's at stake. That was not done in the last election. People were like, well, he's sort of silly. You know, she's going to win. So I'll stay home. No, this you know, needs to be sort of framed as, um, you know, life and death. Cause yes. it's, that's really what it is. Maybe pandemic makes that more clear, but I think we just don't do a very good job of framing it properly. This fly is like, really. I know the flies around that fly is like, that's a metaphor for just the nuisance, right? Like I agree. <laughs> the nuisance of like white supremacy and misogyny. It is um, it's trying to, it's, it's trying to uh, ruin my whole, whole vibe here. <laughs> You are, you know, your, your work in the world is such where you're called upon um, for your legal mind, your political analyses, um, for your expert opinion on a variety of different issues. So a lot of your work is spent uh, providing analyses. And to provide analyses doesn't mean that your heart isn't in it, that your soul isn't in it, mm -hmm. um, that your body, that your whole being isn't in it. So as I'm reading a book, it's interesting because there's these moments where you see you the human mm -hmm. person who's also impacted even in the work that you're doing. So I really want to talk a second about the Bernie bros and John yeah. Cusack and Twitter trolls. Um, and cause there's a moment in the book where you're talking, you talk about a specific incident that occurred on Twitter, which I love for you to share, mm -hmm. but what was really at the heart of that story was your critique of the violent and pervasive misogyny and massage, mm -hmm. massage noir as Moya, Bill, Moya, uh, Moya Bailey would say, that's been at the heart of us politics. So I'd love just to hear more. Um, like, I don't know if people feel that you're impervious to the weapons that are like white racism or misogyny or massage noir that comes your way, even as you're in the world um, pushing against it. So maybe talk about that, John Cusack. Yeah. How that how yeah. that made you feel and how you have to get up every day in spite yeah. of the, the ways you got to talk, you know, you're being targeted in some ways almost all the time. Well, I think the biggest lesson I've learned um, that helps me with that is that I think it's what the second agreement. Don't take it personally. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, generally I, I do believe that people that I don't know, um, their opinions of me as a person, like who I am fundamentally, like I can't really consider those as like having any va value to me because they don't know me. So how will you know, like you're a terrible person or you, you're, you're a terrible writer or you're terrible at this. Like if you don't know me, I can't wait. I can't weigh that. Cause mm -hmm. it, you know, you, you're not basing that on anything other than like what you project, you know, onto me or what you think I'm about or what you think I'm like. Um, and so part of it is just like really fundamentally being like, unless it's somebody that really knows who I am and I respect them and they're close to me and I know that they have my best interests. Like I really just, I don't really care what people say like, and that, that I had to like train that, but that wasn't the big, that wasn't how it first started. I mean, I went through like, you know, I, I'm a survivor. So, so a lot of, um, you know, the trolling, it can be, you know, very threatening. So, so I went, I had to work through it. I had to work through sort of like not being triggered by it, not, not, not really reading it, like, you know, internalizing it and getting all upset about it. Like I, but, I, but there were periods where I did, um, this, I think cycle though, the John Cusack moment that mostly I laughed at, but I, I use it as an example because one, I really love say anything. Like that's just like, really, <laughs> that's a, one of my favorite. And for movies. those who may not know, they haven't yeah. read the book yet. What ha <laughs> yeah. Tell them what happened. <laughs> so I was one Saturday night. This is true. I'm just sitting there minding my business. My, I'm probably watching something on Netflix because I wasn't, even before we were in quarantine, I wasn't like going out all the time because you know, I'm in my thirties. So I wasn't like, you know, out in the running the streets or anything like that. Like, I, I think I was like home and I noticed like I was getting a lot of notifications on my Twitter and I was like, what is, what, who quoted tweeted me? Who did this? 
Because it's always somebody like well known with a big following, and they have quote tweeted you, and now you have like all of this mess in your feed. Um, and I and I realized it was John Cusack. He think I think he said like I work for MSDNC or something, and that I was a shill, something like that. Like you, usually it's like Hillary Shill, you know, from MSDNC. You know, that's usually the insult, and like a red rose or you know something like that. And um, and I was and so then it was just a pile on because he has millions of followers. So I just thought it was so interesting. One, he's one of my, like, I love his movies and grew, grew up with his movies, but also came to have, like, an interesting critique of his movies um, and, and many of the, the famous scenes from his movies. So in the book, I'm talking about how Say Anything is my favorite movie. However, um, when I sort of grew a more, you know, critical lens on content, just because feminist, being a feminist requires that, it just changes the way you watch stuff. And I would, I was like, actually, wait, in the sequence of this movie, she breaks up with him and then he shows up at her window in the middle of the night with the radio in the trench coat, you know, the, the iconic mm -hmm. scene. And I was like, wait, that's kind of stalkerish. Like, that's actually kind of creepy. Um, and I think it, it's sort of a funny anecdote to point out that, you know, it was interesting that it was John Cusack in particular mm -hmm. that was sort of leading this pile on. And so I sort of say, like, there are, all, there are always pl places and spaces where we can sort of look and... Uh, critique the things that we love, um, including famous people in our favorite childhood movies. Um, but also, I feel like, you know, it, it's women of color that have been the most targeted by mm. these trolls, not only, not only, but, but by and large, and I felt like it needed to be called out. It's not something that should be tolerated on our side of the movement. Um, you know, the, the tent on the progressive left should have me inside of it. <laughs> Like yes. Maybe they should put the black woman first and then we should, you know, everybody else can join in. It's like Noah's Ark. Like we, we should be the first, you know, because we are engaged, active. We are the base. We show up. We vote in higher rates than anyone else. And we always center everyone else in the work that we're doing. Like we, that's just how black women roll. So for me, it's like, don't attack me. Don't attack me. You better make me your friend. Yeah. You need me. Um, and so I felt like, the John Cusack moment was a moment where it was both a little bit amusing to me just because of the context of who he is in the world. Um, but also I think it was representative of how, you know, it, there is an effect on you. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't think that, I mean, I haven't like cried over, you know, being harassed on Twitter in a very long time, but I have cried before mm -hmm. and felt like, you know, attacked and like traumatized and triggered. And then, you know, you sort of go outside and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm in Harlem. People in my neighborhood aren't on Twitter. You know, Twitter's not real life. Mm -hmm. And so then I feel better about it. So, you know, I, I, cause I remember a moment when, when I was living up in Harlem, I remember a moment where I went on Hannity and I got all these death threats after, and it was horrible because it was like the first time I, I had experienced that. I mean, I've experienced it unfortunately many times now, Yeah. Um, but it was the first sort of w big pile on. And I just remember being like, I have to, I have to go outside. I have to go outside. I closed my computer and I was like, I just have to go outside and walk around the block. And I was, when I got out there and I was like, Oh, no one out here knows what's going on on Twitter. No one understands that I did a handy segment. The people didn't like, now they're mad and sending me threats. Like the people in the world, you know, they're not, it, you know, up on that, all that day to day. So I encourage people who do feel like they're getting piled on to step away. I usually give it a three day, three days, step away. I feel, I feel that so hard. I've yeah. had my moment. Well, right now. Me. Can you, can you tweet right now? Because I can't. I, I don't know if I can. That's a good question. I can't question. tweet. That is a really, really good question. I can't even log in. I'm really? Really? Oh, right, because of the, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I changed there. my password, and then I tried to log back in, and then it told me that I had to reset my password, and then I tried to reset it, and now I'm locked out. Wow. So, Here we, who knows? This, this, Maybe we won't have Twitter, of, uh, probably Twitter <laughs> trolls in the future, because I won't be able to tweet. Because we won't be able to get on. <laughs> um, look, I, I, you know, part of um, the, the pile on of love that I want to offer in this conversation is just a continual... Uh, evaluation and celebration of Black womanhood. So I want to turn turn there again. Um, mm -hmm. It's important one to have your words in the world. One because you're brilliant and you have um, something to offer us. 
You also happen to be um, a person who is writing from the world and a point of view of a black woman, which in many ways, you know, we, we like, you know, black women are magical, but black, black women are so human. Um, but they're often invisibilized, not only within uh, the publishing world, but particularly th within um, politics. So, you know, I thought it was so amazing that you named um, black women, the genealogy of black women who've come before you, walking alongside of you, like the self-proclaimed colored, original mm -hmm. color girls, Donna yeah. Brazil, yeah. the Reverend Lee Adultery, many and more, Yolanda Carraway, Tina Flournoy. I'm also thinking about people like Shirley Chisholm. Yeah. And you, you know, you're, you're naming these folk in your book. Talk about the mattering of black women within the context of American politics. You said, you just said that, you know, in many ways, black women need to be centered because you are the base. Yeah. <laughs> But we not have, only we're but, out here winning these elections, winning elections. <laughs> you're out here strategizing. I mean, yeah. I'm thinking about Stacey Abrams. I'm thinking about um, uh, like Nata I'm, so many folk, Latasha Brown. I'm thinking Natasha about Brown. Yeah, yeah, you know, like all of these Linda Carr, Linda Carr, like Eldrick Williams, all, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Jessica, um, yeah, Jessica, Bird. Jessica, like, and here are folk out here that are actually, actually like moving, doing brilliant organizing work within the political sphere. I just thought about Elizabeth Warren's most recent campaign staff, come on, and all of yeah, these, yeah, come on, my, my baby sister, listen, I mean, not really, but. Yeah. So could you talk about um, yeah. the, the mattering of Black women within the context of, um, uh, of American politics, even as they're, you're often invisibilized? Well, it's 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 so interesting in this moment to think about it, because I was just actually watching. I haven't watched all of it yet, but I, I had started watching Mrs. America on Hulu. And it's such an interesting perspective on the history of that moment, because obviously they're centering the whole story around Phyllis Shafley and right. her opposition to the Equal Rights mm -hmm. Amendment. But at the same time, um, you know, there were obviously the women's movement leaders of the yeah. second wave, um, you know, meeting directly with Democratic presidential candidates and and having a dialogue around our issues. And so mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a part of a lineage, right? I mm -hmm. feel like I'm a part, uh, I mean, and obviously it's a whole episode about Shirley Chisholm and her run for president. Um, and I just feel like, and, and also the tension between black feminists and white feminists. I mean, it's just, it, it has all of it. And it's educational for those who don't know the history so that they can understand the present. Yes. And I think, you know, right now on the campaign, one of the most important things that we did was, I mean, Hillary hired a bunch of black people. I mean, that was just a bunch. I mean, like the, the chief, uh, HR person was a black man, um, you know, so he he made sure that, that there were there were black women um, all over the place. Um, the person who built the website was a black woman. The person who did I'm with her was a black woman. You know, there were just black women in all the different departments as well. And I think that was important, not because, you know, it's like, oh, look at all the black girls. It's like we're in the meeting and we're never quiet. <laughs> so one of the things um, about, you know, the argument that you said where, you know, put, put us it first, we should go in first. And then you build, you know, you build your movement based on a foundation um, that's solid. And the reason I say that is because, you know, even in my, in my own um, experience on the campaign, you know, I was loud. I mean, there is one moment in the book, I think, where I say like, I didn't speak up and I regretted it ever since. I, I still regret that. it. Yeah. Uh, I still regret it. Um, but from that moment forward, I did not, I was not shy. Ask anyone on the campaign. I was like, wait, I was raising my hand all the time, all the time. <laughs> like, wait, wait, flag. I just want to flag, you know, like this doesn't sound right. This is a little tone deaf. This is, it should change this way. And so we are, we are loud. Um, and we, we have to be mm -hmm. so, to your point about sort of often how we're invisibilized, mm -hmm. not just within the progressive movement, but just in general, I mean, I don't know how many times I get hit in the head. Well, when we used to be able to travel, how many times I would get like elbowed in the head because, you know, somebody wouldn't see me as they're taking their suitcase, you know, or putting their suitcase up. Like, I just feel like uh, I'm often invisible. I have a line actually in public, like when people bump into me because they just literally do not see me. I go like, <laughs> hi, I'm made of matter and I take up space, you know, like, <laughs> um, and I just say it just like that. So it's not, it's not, you know, it's sort of a, it's a light moment, but it's, I made the serious point that you didn't see me. And, and the, or they'll say like, oh, I didn't see you. I'm like, I know, but I'm made of matter and I take up space. So I, I didn't just see me because I, I exist. That's right. Um, and I think, you know, that's sort of the light way to, you know, the, a light way to talk about the real way in which we are obscured from the center of the po political conversation. 
because we, I mean, even right now, they're doing a better job of, um, you know, talking about the electorate, but they're still focusing on suburban white women because suburban white women flipped, you know, in the 2018 midterms, right? Mm -hmm. So they are like done with uh, voting for Republicans in this specific moment. But it's still black women that are like propelling the movement, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're still showing up too. Doug Jones is a senator. Like we have, we've proved the point over and over. And yet people are still going to certain segments of the white voting bloc to be like, oh, you're the most important. Oh no, you're the most important. And black women have always been the most important. You know, you, you get them first because they bring, Leah Daughtry, Reverend Leah Daughtry always used to say this, black women will take the whole church to you and the whole household and the whole neighborhood block. And that is, that's why we're the, the, the focus should be the focus an investment in infrastructure um, and we should be inside of campaigns and we should be a part of the leadership of, you know, the establishment going forward because we, we center everyone, mm -hmm. you know, in, in what we do because it helps us too, because we're often at the bottom. So if we, if we're helping the most marginalized, that's usually us. I mean, I think the conversation this week that people are having, um, online because uh, Angela Davis said she's going to vote for Joe Biden and explain why. And I thought that was a really interesting um, dialogue. One, because I think, you know, I think there was a tweet that said, like, what does Angela Davis don't know that you don't know? Right. Like it, he, she's voting for Biden. So what does she know that you or like, like, what do you know that Angela Davis does not know about, mm -hmm. you know, why you have to so, sort of like vote for yourself and vote for your own survival? Um, but even anecdotally, after the 2016 campaign, I went to a conference in Italy, and that's where I met Camon. And um, we had dinner after with Angela Davis, and we were talking about the election, obviously, because it was only a couple weeks. It was like maybe November 17th or something. So it was like right after. It was right after the election. We were all still stunned and shocked all over the world, but obviously, as Americans and you know, per, working on the campaign, I was like still in shock. And she was talking about, like, yeah, I wanted Hillary to win. Like, I, wa like I, was, I was for Hillary Clinton. Like, it wasn't like a decision. That's not like a big choice. And also, I don't think you get, I think we do this, like, performative wokeness where it's like, I'm not for Joe Biden. You know, like, and somehow that makes you more progressive. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you can be progressive. But understand that fundamentally in this moment, part of that is going to participate in this election and voting for the candidate who will distribute a vaccine to your family members in an organized fashion. I mean, this is like, it's not a game. And so I feel like that debate uh, that's been happening about Angela Davis, I found interesting because she told me that right after the 2016 election. So I already sort of, I wasn't surprised when I saw that she was voting for Biden because she explained to me she's voting for herself. She's voting for herself. I feel like that's where we're at in this moment. I mean, a big love to folk like Angela Davis um, and, you know, I think about other folk like Kathy Cohen and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Marion Caba, who have also been very central to helping us uh, develop a more enhanced Kimberly Crenshaw, who we named, right? Yeah. Um, political framework, particularly the latter of which um, in this moment where so many people are talking about abolitionism and mm -hmm visions for a future, those black women were central to helping us think about that. So speaking right. of black women again, I want to read some more words from your book to you. Isn't it funny? Like it's as a writer, I know, I was it's like, always oh, interesting. Um, yeah. When people would read words back, like, did I write that? No, um, I was and, like, I was like know? some days I'm like, oh yeah, I remember when I wrote I that. Remember or when like, I wrote that. That was good. That was some exactly. good editing that put those words together. Cause I was like, I, I remember that. <laughs> I remember editing that. And that came out really good. I like how that, you know, that's, this is a fun exercise. So I get to read to you, but at the, before I do that, I want to invite all of those that are tuning in to feel, please feel free to submit questions. Uh, we certainly want this to be a conversation and we certainly would love for Zelina to respond to your questions. Um, so submit some, uh, because in a few, we'll be asking um, you to, to, to engage us in discussion. But you write, sexism and racism are a stew of bigotry but they can both exist alone and manifest at the same time in many ways. Trump's misogyny didn't deter 13% of black men from voting for a man who said the first black president wasn't legitimate or even American. 
That's a lot to overlook if you live every day as a black man with the deli slights and sometimes egregious examples of bigotry and violence, but they did. And it's not a coincidence that the alternative was a woman named Hillary Clinton, that they would rather have that they would have rather seen a racist white man in an Oval Office than a woman speaks volumes. I do hate to say this, but some black men don't want all people to be equal. Some want to be equal to white men and ultimately dominate all women, all colors of women. Imagine this. Anti-Black racism and bias isn't the only race-based discrimination that women of color face. Sometimes a call is coming from inside the house. We also have to be face bias from within, a vestige of our Black American history dating back to slavery. I just wanted to stop there and say that there <laughs> is the stuff of, you know, I, I think about Patricia Hill Collins and Bell Hooks. Yes. Yeah. This idea of the simultaneity of oppressions that Black women face, you made it so very clear for us. Um, and I want to I want to talk about that, particularly in a moment now where so many of us are feeling galvanized to act. Um, and this goes back to your previous point that to have a politic that is the end of a white politics is to have an intersectional one. Right. Exactly. Um, and so talk like I, I'm, I'm, I was so moved by this and maybe to be even more specific, you know, in a moment now where we have black trans women who are being killed. By right. black black cis men most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. In the moment where we know where um, Tarana Burke is asking, and so many other black women are asking us to think about um, sexual violence within our own, that we have to have the courage to begin to confront the ways that sometimes we try to rely on the very things that harm us, yeah. um, and we we harm each other. So talk a little bit about the need for us to sort of have the courageous conversations uh, with the with each other. Um, to end those type of biases too. I mean, since 2016, I've I've thought a lot about the 13% of Black men that voted for Donald Trump, and I think be, I think we talk a lot more about the 53% of white women that voted for Donald Trump, and because we're, we just can't imagine that a, a white woman would vote against a white woman, you know, for somebody who speaks about women the way Donald Trump does. Um, but I also think it's it's interesting in a different way that black men could overlook the racism and also the misogyny because it wasn't just racism that he was, mm -hmm. um, you know, on record, um, you know, talking in horrible terms about, you know, what he does to women. Um, but he was, he was also talking about, he called a Latina, um, you know, a con beauty contestant, you know, Miss Piggy. He, he, he's mm -hmm. spoken in derogatory terms well since about Omarosa. I mean, you can feel how you want to feel about Omarosa, but you shouldn't be calling anybody a dog. You just shouldn't be doing that. And so, you, I mean, I think the ways in which you can overlook the dehumanization of women, but particularly black women, um, you know, I've had a lot of good conversations with my dad in the past few years about the, di like, the different ways in which we experience oppression. And like, he's not, you know, a super feminist or anything like that in, in, in any way. I mean, I think I'm sort of educating him a lot, but like, even recently, he was like, man, I, you know, it's hard to be a black man, but I just realized it is really hard to be a black woman. And I was like, dad, <laughs> I've been telling you, you this. have two daughters and a <laughs> wife. You literally live in a house with three black women. And you didn't realize that it was particularly difficult uh, for us in, in very specific ways. Um, but I think that we, had, we just have to be honest about it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the treatment of Kamala Harris um, during the 2020 primary in particular was quite offensive to me. And that that came from inside the house as well. A lot of it did. You know, certainly there was a sort of media type that was skeptical of her candidacy and whether or not it was serious. Um, you're like, they, they sort of did the double edge. They're like, she's the bright, shiny neck, wait, you know, new thing uh, that is like, she she is like the, the female version of Obama. But then like, why isn't she living up to being the female version of Obama? Because there isn't a female version of Obama. That's the point. Because we, we can't do it. Because we, we have it. You, there is no female version of that it, when it comes to the presidency. There's no example. So I think, you know, there was the sort of media type that was very harsh and critical of her. And then there were black men and men of color who were saying, well, she's a cop. <laughs> you know, Kamala's a cop. And then that, that was amplified by sort of, you know, supporters of other primary candidates. And what I say in the book is that, yeah, she was a DA. But what laws do you think DAs follow? the ones that are written by Joe Biden. And so he's the nominee. 
<laughs> you know, and 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 yet you were like, Kamala's a cop. She locked up the black men. I'm like, Joe Biden wrote the crime bill, the bill, the law that she was following. Like, it, it really is like, why don't you get this? So I'm not saying that, you know, in this moment, we can't have a nuanced analysis of Joe Biden also. But I think because that you, we, you offer one in your book. Yeah, I, yeah it's a whole chapter. <laughs> I mean, it's, and it's really like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's thorough and it is it's critical and critical. And let me be clear. I, you know, I think, you know, one of the things I want to lift up here is sometimes we hear criticism. Um, there's this, this way that we understand that as sort of hate. And, and what James Baldwin said about like, it's, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, it's, a, it's precisely because he loves America that right. he's able to critique it, right? So right. you would not lie to the thing that you love. So when we're talking and calling, you know, when we're calling each other into, you know, critiquing each other, you know, whether that's black men or men in general, like that's out of love. Yeah. If, if you're critiquing Joe, but like if, if Joe Biden expects of, or any political person expects of, um, you know, camaraderie to be built for community, that that love or that respect should also include criticism. And you you lay it out. Yeah, I mean, I book. hope I hope they read it. <laughs> I didn't send it. I didn't send it to them or anything. But I I think they'll probably tickle. I'm sure. I know there are people on the campaign that have it because some of them worked for Hillary too. Um, and so I hope they incorporate some of some of the thoughts that I that I have and that I share about you know, just confronting his record, being honest mm. about it. I mean, you know, there's no reason to be defensive because it is what it is. You know, like your record is what it is. People are going to feel that way about it. And, you know, you have to at least make them feel a little less anxious that you don't get it or that you don't see how we've evolved on these issues. I mean, it was a big debate in, in the campaign in 2016 about, you know, the super predator comment because, you know, there was there was a lot of time <laughs> where there was not an apology and, you know, she explores this in a documentary on Hulu about, you know, sort of what she was thinking in terms of, you know, how to do the apology, whether it was warranted, whether or not she would just be apologizing for everything all the time. There's always those thoughts on a campaign. But for me, it was like fundamental. We have evolved on these issues. Um, we've evolved on these these issues because of the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Yes. Um, and, and we... We see everything very differently. We see this as a public health issue. Now we're in the opioid crisis. <laughs> you know, it's a crisis when when the drugs are in the hands of white families and communities, but when it was the crap epidemic, when it was um, black and brown communities. And so I think, you know, it's, it, it requires a public health response and more compassion. And I just felt like, you know, I was the sort of younger black staffer in there, you know, pushing back against older, um, you know, political folks who had maybe even been there during the debate in the 1990s when the CBC was asking, begging President Clinton, mayors were begging President Clinton to pass the crime bill. I mean, it, it was a, a lot of us, we weren't, weren't really like aware because we were very young at that time. But I think it's important to go back to that history, reflect on it, you know, be, be held accountable for it. And then you can move forward because now we trust that you get it. And I think that's where I, where I stand when it comes to Joe Biden. Like, I do think that he gets it. I don't think that he, um, you know, is going to get in there and be like, you know, hard headed and be like, nope, I'm not going to change anything. Like, I think he actually is open to evolving. He said he wanted to be a transitional figure. So I was giving him some tips. Cool. <laughs> so we have, I'm, I'm sitting here fielding so many questions for you. Oh, okay. We don't have a lot of time for them. So I'm going to try to pick um, maybe three to four. Um, and then we have one final closing question for you. And then we'll go from there. Um, I'm, to, to the viewers, you know, I wish I could get to all of these questions. I'm so sorry that we won't be able to, but you all can engage Zerlina in the work that she's doing in the world and on Twitter when she's back on it. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I can get back in my account. <laughs> um, Lynn is asking, how can we engage ignored voters, um, i.e. I, young, young, young folk, Black folk, disenfranchised, disenchanted folk, authentically without appearing to be pandering to them? That's a good question because that's a question that comes up a lot on campaigns. And, you know, a lot of times when you don't have um, enough diversity on a campaign, the mostly white staff can say, well, you, you can't do that because that's pandering. And they'll mm -hmm. assess what they think is pandering to that other community that they don't belong to. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is a campaign has to hire diverse staff because mm -hmm. then you won't be pandering because you'll have people authentically from that community that know how to speak to their own communities. And I'm not saying they speak for the whole community, 
but they will have an insight into what works, what doesn't, what language works, what language does not work, um, frankly. Um, and you avoid mistakes, which is one big piece of that. Speaking or, you know, authentically and directly to those ignored communities, though, I think in this cycle, I think it can't just be Joe Biden. Like he's not always the, he's not the messenger for every part of the message. And that's a really unorthodox thing to say as a political operative, because most the traditionally campaigns will say the principal is the most effective messenger. I don't think that's true in this cycle. I think it's a really unorthodox cycle. I think as we're sort of transitioning to a new generation of the AOC and Ayanna Presses of the world, you know, Joe Biden may not be the best messenger, but maybe that's AOC or maybe that's Ayanna Presley or maybe that's, you know, a rapper. I don't know, a basketball player, um, an influencer, um, Ricky Thompson. You know, like it could be someone who people are listening to for another reason. And then tomorrow they get on and they're like talking about policy, the election, how to register to vote, because this is an election that is, you know, a matter of life and death for us. So for me, I think it's a, it's a matter, they're already, the Biden campaign and, and those folks, the establishment, they're already using influencers and surrogates. Um, but oftentimes they put them in traditional media spaces. So they've, they've just now started sort of doing the IG lives and the D nice concerts, you know, with Kamala sort of to engage people where they are. But I think they need to do more. So that's what I, I you know, like they need to get those K-pop folks that did the TikTok action <laughs> against Donald Trump's rally. And those people need to be hired up by all of these campaigns and engage, like just let them go, go forth and make content. We have another question from Rob um, who says, who is the future of the Democratic Party? Any names you think we should be paying attention to that most people are not? Ayanna Presley. <laughs> she's going to be the president of the United States. Um, I mean, I think obviously Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the squad is amazing. I mean, all, all of them individually are excellent. But before I even knew about the squad, before I even knew um, about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I knew about Ayanna Presley because in 2015, maybe even in 2014, um, she won an award at Emily's List. And I remember going and I sat, I was right in the front. And I just remember like midway through just being like, this is going to be the president of the United States. I was like, this is going to be the president of the United States. She's going to be the president. This is the president. I'm watching a president. If she asked me to work for her today, I will quit all of my jobs. <laughs> um, and, and so for me, I think that's, that's because of, of her um, perspective on policy. So she goes into elected office and public service with this quote in mind. I mean, like, this is the way that she sees service. The people closest to the pain need to be the closest to the power. I quote that in the book because that's fundamentally like how I sort of see it, but she puts it much more eloquently. Um, and I think, you know, that she's always staying engaged. It's not like I have to go find, you know, those community leaders when it's about to be election day to engage them at that point. She's in constant conversation, you know, and it's, it's about electing a diverse set of folks from all different backgrounds so they can all bring themselves into the meeting where they're, they're coming up with policy. I mean, this policy affects our lives. If we can't realize that now in pandemic, that the people that are, we have to elect people that know about science, that believe in science, that understand how to process information. Um, and if we don't do that, then, you know, that puts our families at risk. And so it's so incredibly important to elect people who care about the people in pain. Mm -hmm. That's first. But I would say Ayanna Presley is the future. And I have already, I have like at least six friends, all black women, political people that like when she runs, we're all going to be there. We're like, I'll see you 20, whatever, 2024, 2028, 20, you know, whatever. I don't know what year it is, but the, you know, for the presidential campaign of Ayanna Presley, we're all going to be there. It's going to be like a key key. Like you're just going <laughs> to like, it'll be like the sisters are here, you know? <laughs> like it, I say in my book. <laughs> Andy asks, I don't understand why white people have such a hard time understanding the near universal benefits of policies advocated by um, BLM, black political thinkers. Why do you think that is? And you sort of address this in your book too. Yeah, I mean, I think they don't, they don't engage because they don't have to. I mean, I think like part, part of what I'm, I'm saying in the book about privilege is not that I'm not calling anybody racist. I mean, I don't know. I don't know them. 
but I know that they're privileged because they don't have to think about, you know, whether or not they'll be sexually harassed or street harassed because of their outfit or shot because of their outfit because, you know, they're a black person like Amon Arbery. And so that's, those are two things that you didn't have to do. And that adds up over, over the course of a lifetime. It, it, you know, your emotional and sort of physical bandwidth to process all of those, you know, microaggressions and real aggressions, you know, that has an impact on people in their life every single day. And if you don't have to have any of those thoughts, I mean, imagine the freed up brain space and just energy, but not to mention the policy benefits, the economic benefits, you know, the tangible benefits of safety and, and really advocacy and attention. I think it's just, you know, I know that it's hard to admit that, that, that perhaps, you know, just because you're not economically privileged, um, you know, it's hard to see that you're privileged in other ways, but you have to admit it. It doesn't, I mean, it's not going to hurt. I'm privileged in certain ways. I can walk. I have an education. I have certain socioeconomic privilege. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways in which I'm privileged and I just named a few and it's fine. We have a question from Angelica. Um, this is the last one we'll take. Uh, it's that reminds me of Hamilton, which I was just listening to. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is tactical, um, but it, and I think it's a good question. How might we tackle voter suppression in the upcoming elections, in particular HMW vote safety in the midst of the pandemic, especially if some states might not make vote by mail accessible or possible? So the first thing is right now in, in Congress, they are talking about the next funding package. And in that funding package, there is money, hopefully, or will be, hopefully, for mail-in voting to scale it up, right? Because basically, for, to make mail-in voting possible, they have to, like, print the envelopes and, you know, like, it's li literally the logistics of it have to be funded. So that is the funding that's going to be in a bill that they're debating because they still have to figure out you know, whether or not they're going to give money directly to the American people who only got $1,200 one time three months ago um, at the beginning of pandemic. So that's the first piece is the funding piece. So like I always say on my show every day, like, please call your congressperson and tell them to vote only for a bill that includes the funding for the mail-in ballot access um, to scale that up. If in lieu of mail-in ballot access, which I think that's sort of where our focus should be. Like that should be where Joe Biden is focused. That should be where the Democratic establishment is focused because that's the way to ensure that the most people participate. Because a lot of people are going to say, if I have to go over in person and it's still COVID, I'm not going. I mean, that's, first of all, it shouldn't be a question that we're asking people is to like put their lives on, you know, at risk to cast their ballot in this way. Um, even though historically people have done that a lot. Um, you know, you, you don't want to put people in that position. One of the things that we did, I think it was a narrative in 2016 that if you talk about voter suppression, you suppress the vote by mm -hmm. making people think that it's very difficult, right? So you want to make people see that voting is very easy and that it's, but I think that this election is so unique that you can't get away with that. Mm -hmm. You actually have to say, they're trying to take away your vote. They're trying to make it very hard for you to vote. And it's a pandemic. So it may not be as easy, you know, as it ever was before, unless you have mail-in voting access. And that's why I say focus on that. But what I always say, if you're, if the right to vote wasn't valuable, they would not try so hard to take it away. Mm. They, 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 they beat and kill people who are advocating for their right to participate as a citizen in this country, in our democracy. And if that wasn't something that were powerful, they would have not have done that. They would have just, you know, gone to worry about something else that was happening. But obviously it is central to achieving, you know, um, certain aspects of power, which is what this is about. Because for me, it's not, you know, the politics of it is cool um, and the policy piece of it is big. But for me, it's like actually having black and brown people, young people, many more women in positions of political power and decision-making positions um, because then we get better decisions. So I think mail-in ballot access is the most important, but in lieu of that, I think we have to be very honest about the fact that they are trying to take our votes away. Like we have to directly talk about voter suppression um, and talk about the fact that it's happening and then educate people around the ways in which they can safely vote 
in November and beyond, um, understanding that there are there are obstacles. Like I don't think we can ignore the fact that the obstacles exist. I think that we have to explain them, highlight them, and and also tell people why. Mm-hmm. Because I think you know the argument. Oh, you know, voting may be difficult because they're they're trying to suppress the vote. They just passed a new voter ID law. You know, I think the data analytics folks will say, well, pe- you know, that means that people are less inclined to vote because maybe the data, you know, the focus group question was like, if there was a voter ID law that required X, Y, Z, like, are you more or less likely to vote? Like, maybe the responses were, you're less likely to vote. But how many of those people were black? Because I do not think human, like, just human nature of certain communities of, um, you know, in, in certain populations in America, they do not have that worldview. I don't, I, I just don't think that that data is giving us the right information about what people will really do when the election comes around. Um, and they're told the powers that be do not want you to do this. They do not want you to participate. Like, I feel like I want to like vote as hard as I can, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that, it, we that was a big debate on the, uh, uh, among us in, in 2016. It really still is. I'm one of the few out here being like, if they're trying to take away my vote, I'm going to go want to go do it more. So I, I think that we're, we have it a little backwards. So we have to talk about it. And then in the present moment, the tangible thing we can all do is call our Congress people to push for the funding for the mail-in, mail-in ballot access. We do have, it looks like I do have time for to ask one more question okay. before I give you our final. And that is with everything that is happening, I'm finding myself, this is Claudia, I'm finding myself feeling overwhelmed more often. How do you, how do you stay grounded and regulate it in order to keep forging ahead? Well, that is a normal feeling right now. I think a lot of people are giving themselves a little bit of a hard time. Like one of the things, phrases that stuck in my head in the beginning of the pandemic was give myself, give yourself grace. You know, if you're if you're having a you're struggling in a particular moment, like just give yourself a moment because or give yourself grace in that moment, um, because we've never lived through this before. No one knows how to do pandemic correctly. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of folks in the beginning like this is how you're going to live your best life in quarantine. <laughs> and I was like, how you know, unfollow. How do you know? <laughs> I was like. How do you know? And then like, I remember in the beginning when people were like, this is how you should wash your groceries. And I'd be like, how do you know? How do you know? Um, I mean, I live with a scientist and even he's guessing because we don't know this is a new virus. So I was just like frustrated. Um, But I think like give yourself grace is a good mantra to sort of think about. Um, I also every single day, this is true. Every single day I listen to a, a moving meditation Mm. Yeah, I mean, the way you do this is you listen to it while you're in the shower, just pro tip, um, because then you can, um, you know, you're sort of doing something else and you can, you get your meditation in. So I, I listen to a moving meditation that sort of just grounds me every day and sort of like calms me a little bit. Cause this is, I mean, you know, everybody's dealing with their own specific set of circumstances in this pandemic. Some people are taking care of parents, some people are taking care of kids, um, and working full time. So this is, this is unprecedented and just the amount of stress that you're going to feel. Um, but I feel like this is, this is as hard as it's like, this is pretty hard. Like, you know, on the scale of like, it, it probably, I mean, I don't even want to jinx it in a way. Right. It's like, but this is pretty bad on this yeah, you know, spectrum of bad. So, you know, give yourself a little bit of space to feel a little bit unstable and uneasy in this moment, because you should, if you were feeling great, like I said in the beginning of this, I had a joke where, uh, if people, you know, like everybody I spoke to would be like, I'm just having so much trouble sleeping. I can't <laughs> sleep. And I'm like, if you called me and you were like, I'm sleeping like a baby, like I would be concerned about you. Right. <laughs> I would be like, what is wrong with you? If you can sleep during pandemic, like, I don't know how you do, you're doing that. But I, if you're restless, if you're feeling uneasy, like that feels very normal for lack of a better word and healthy. Because you're processing, that means you're processing all of this. So I always, I, I listen to my moving meditation. I have not missed a day of working out in this entire pandemic. I am, unless it was like a scheduled rest day in the calendar of the workout program I was doing, like I still sometimes go for a run anyway, just because like there's no reason for me to take a day off. One, I'm, I'm training for it to run away fast. 
in case of an, you know, like I just feel like this dystopia requires me to be in shape because I might have to run with my belongings at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you just kind of have to. I, I'm, but but honestly, like it also helps me stay sane. So it's just really trying moving my body, doing something good for myself that's healthy, especially when you're dealing with something that affects your lungs. You want to sort of like maybe get my cardio up, <laughs> um, or at least in my brain, that's how I think about it. Um, but give yourself a little grace in this moment because this is a hard one. This is not this is not a normal moment that we're in, and I don't I really don't know how it ends. So yeah. that's I think why the uncertainty is what makes people very anxious. Well, that's also like a really perfect segue to our last question. This one is asked of all guests on Inform Talks. Um, what is your sixty second idea? to change the world. I want to mandate that everyone uh, should and can uh, go to therapy um, whenever they want, how much they want. That's my movement. I mean, I also want to mandate voting, but I feel like therapy is better because then mm. I feel like, it, honestly, I feel like if people, if everyone was able to go and process, you know, all of their traumas, all of their, you know, all the things that they're experiencing, um, you know, day in and day out, then they would be better able to communicate in the present moment um, when when you're trying to deal with, you know, difficult things in the workplace or interpersonally or just in the world. Um, and I find that therapy, like, it's like maintenance. I, I always think about therapy as like working out for my emotional health. Like, it's kind of like, I'm checking in, I'm just checking in. And like, you know, when something goes wrong, you'll have those tools, you'll have like sort of a toolkit to, to go to and your coping mechanisms that you've learned throughout the years. You know, if you're, if you're, cause I've experienced trauma. So I had, you know, I sort of had to go to therapy and work through all of that. But now it's like, you know, you get to the place where even if you're having a stressful day or a moment, that's like a lot less severe than that, obviously you still have those go-to things to, you know, to, to tap into. I mean, working out for me is a big piece of that, but I think my movement is mandatory therapy. Mandatory therapy. Well, Zona's access. Mandatory and access, access to therapy. therapy. Yeah. I mean, um, Zelina Maxwell. Thank you. Oh, thank you, you kissed the for book. all that you do. Um, you all, yeah. you know, we're talking about the end of white politics, how to heal our liberal divide by the author. Here's Zelina Maxwell by the book. Um, and thank you so much for being thank gracious um, in this conversation. And I hope that many people read it um, and that the conversations keep happening. Thank you so much to Inform. And to everybody who tuned in, um, thank you for taking time to, to sit and spend time with us. More soon. Yes. Thank you.